Hello CS48. In this video, I'm going to go over Unit 2 lecture, which covers network protocols and standards along with OSI layers. So in this week, you are to look at Unit 2 or Week 2 materials. Um, here you will find the notes, which I will go over in this video, along with the assignment, which covers network protocol standards and OSI model. So it would be best that you would follow along with the notes along with completing the assignment when you're watching this video. So in this week, um, the chapter begins with talking about network protocols. And a protocol is a set of rules for formatting and processing data. Uh, network protocols are common language that computer system would use to be able to communicate even though the hardware are manufactured differently. Um, there are standards in how we would design and implement hardware. So protocols allows the computer to um, communicate even though it's using different brand software or so uh, and hardware that were created by different manufacturer. So Protocol is always going to be tied to services such as um, obtaining IP addresses, connecting to a domain, um, using websites or requesting websites. Um, so we would start with the legacy protocol which is known as NetBIOS. And NetBIOS is used to be able to have the system communication without using IP address because back then there was no IP address being implemented. This was created by IBM and it was adopted by Microsoft and uh, NetBIOS extended user interface NetBUI is the version that was commonly found in small networks back then. There was no routable protocol so they implemented what's called NetBuoy in order for the system to communicate. And the protocol would send data and that data would then be communicated from system to system by acknowledging the system information or the system name. So they it would use something like the network manager to be able to identify the information that's being sent from one system to the next. And it also uses MAC address, which is a physical address that would be tied to the communication port of that computer. Back then, it would use a modem um, for dial-up. And so what you would see is that the MAC address would be correlated with the system that is part of a group of system, what we call a network. NetBIOS is uh, known as Network Basic Input and Output Systems and it works only in the upper layers of the OSI. It allows the interface to separate computer to for different computers to communicate over the network. This was created in 1980s by IBM and um, Microsoft and Novell adopted the concept and implemented with their servers and their system. So when you're looking at the older Windows version, like Windows 95, Windows 3.x, or Windows 98, you would see NetBuoy. And with NetBIOS, that was implemented at the beginning of the development of TCP, and that was adopted by Novell Netware and Microsoft. Um, so, and NetBIOS uses port, uh, 137 through 139. It has two modes. One is going to be the session mode, which is used for connection oriented communication to establish sessions uh, between the systems. And the other mode is going to be datagram mode, which is connectionless and it's used to broadcast. So, in the case where it needs to communicate with the system or multiple system it would need to be able to send it using broadcast and the responsibility um, for the application that would tie with NetBIOS. So datagram mode does not support error detection and the correction services. Now, now Network Plus doesn't really 
inquire about NetBIOS or NetBUI, but in the case that you come across these protocols when you're working with older technologies, um, you will likely need to understand what they do and what they are. So in the chapter, to answer the questions, number one, what are the network protocols and how are the network protocols used to establish system communication? For question number one in your assignment, we can simply say that network protocols are a set of rules for formatting and processing data. And the use of protocols enable the system to communicate with each other regardless of different software and hardware. For question number two, what are the benefits of using NetBuoy and in the older networks? It is extremely efficient and simple protocol with little overhead because of their inability to route packets. So there was no resource intensive uh, for NetBuoy. That why that's why it's used. One of the major advantages of NetBuoy is that it is simple to install and configure. Um, there, there is minimal configuration that's required for the protocol to work. So the industry took advantage of NetBuoy and that's how, why it was um, used in the late 80s and going into the 90s. For question 3, it asks you what it, are the differences between session and datagram mode in NetBIOS. The session mode is used for connection-oriented communication in which NetBIOS is responsible for session across the systems, um, monitoring session and detecting error in transmission, then recovering from those errors by retransmitting the data that went missing or corrupt. So before the TCP era, um, session mode was responsible for establishing connection and monitoring if there's error that occur during the session. Datagram mode is connectionless and it is um, it doesn't require the session. Datagram mode is used for uh, by NetBIOS for broadcast. It would send out to all system and it does not report error. So as you can see there, there's no error detection or correction services implemented in the datagram mode. But in the session mode, there will be air correction and uh, notification with the session mode. Going back to the notes, <coughs> we would then explore TCP IP. And TCP IP um, is what being implemented in our networks today, and that's what's used for the internet that's what's used for your home network this is the routable uh, protocol suite mm -hmm. so tcp stands for transmission control protocol and ip stands for internet protocol transmission control protocol its job is to establish communication and acknowledge communication before data transmission internet protocol is responsible for addressing how the system can be receiving information using the addresses. TCP IP was originally designed in 1970s for DARPA, which is a research project with the military. And um, it is mainly used for the, the purpose of managing the network and mm -hmm. communication in our network. So it requires configuration, administration, and IP addressing such as assigning certain IP addresses for certain segment of the network and using subnet masks and IP, uh, if you're using version 4, proper IP version 4 subnetting and also assigning uh, addresses to default gateway and dedicated devices using static IP addresses and default gateways are often routers but it could also be a system. TCP IP also, um, TCP mainly is going to give you reliability and so as far as security goes, the communication design goal in it is to really establish uh, communication using TCP and then addresses using IP. 
Therefore, um, there's not a lot of essential security that was implemented, but then you would see other type of protocol that can work with TCP IP to elevate the security level for our system. So in the next question for your assignment, question four, ask you the internet is built on what which protocol suite? Describe its capability. So the internet is built on transmission con control protocol and internet protocol. TCP IP is robust and commonly is associated with Unix, Linux, Windows, and Mac OS systems or Mac systems. It, the design of TCP IP included the capability to reroute packets. So we can reroute the packets if it's not able to reach through a certain route. Um, and we can also monitor the packets using certain um, software like Wireshark, Network Performance Monitor, and so on. For routable and non-routable protocols, what is really exactly the routable protocol? It is a protocol whose packet may leave the network, pass through routers, and be delivered to the destination network. The non-routable protocol does not have this capability. It's unable to send packets across using a router. And it's a simple protocol. It does not accommodate address patterns for the packets. So a routable protocol would use address to route packets. And the way that we would deliver the packets is through routers. The non-routable protocol does not ad use addresses on the packets. It's unable to use the router to route packets. So there are some protocols that are routable and non-routable. There are some protocols that are connection-oriented. That means that it requires connection establishment and or protocol that are connection less which does not require the establishment of connection so there are distinguished uh, there are differences between the protocols. so make sure that you understand the differences so in the next question question 5 asks you to describe the differences between routable and non-routable protocols Routable protocol is a protocol whose packet may leave the network, pass through a router, and be delivered in the remote network or destination network. A non-routable protocol does not have the capability to send packets across the router. Um, and it, this is because the protocol is simple and it does not accommodate addressing. So in the next part, we're going to talk about routable protocols. The routable protocols are Telnet, and this is the Chameleon protocols it, it, it uses in terminal emulation. It is not secure, and um, a way that the system can communicate remotely back then would use Telnet. Telnet should be disabled in your network because it imposes risk um, and so you want to only enable it when you use it but <clears throat> I advise that you minimally use Telnet. Telnet uses TCP port 23 and as you look through the protocol you will find that some protocol falls under the category of TCP which is connection oriented some, some protocol would be established or fall under the category of UDP or both. So Telnet would achieve uh, would be achieved by pulling the Telnet server communication, making the client machine appear the, as though terminal is co directly connecting. So you can connect directly through the terminal from one system to another. And that's how we're able to remotely connect to specific appliance, system, hosts, and so on.
The next protocol is going to be on file transfer protocol. This is using port number 20 and 21 and it is under the category of TCP. This protocol allows you to transfer a file across the IP network. You can upload, download file, you can share files this way. Um, Sometimes you would have an FTP server. Its job is to be able to distribute file. And so to operate the protocol, um, you would use application such as a browser or an, a software application to be able to download. Um, some FTP server would require authentication and some doesn't. So accessing the host through FTP is the first step. The user must then be subjected to authentication login and they m must provide username and password to be able to access the files. Now the problem with FTP is that all the data is set in clear text just like Telnet so it is not secure. Later on we implemented what's called secure file transfer protocol which uses port 22 it is used to transfer file using encrypted connection. Um, it uses SSH which is secure shell and secure shell uses encrypted session so before we can initialize the session you're given a key and that key is valid for the session. SSH also uses port 22 therefore SFTP uses the same port. So here you would see the explanation for SFTP and another protocol that you would see is going to be the trivial file transfer protocol. This falls underneath the FTP suite and TFTP is stripped down version of FTP in that um, TFTP has no directory browsing ability and it can do nothing but send and receive files. So this is an important area, this area that makes FTP, TFTP different than FTP. So in that sense, the data will be in smaller blocks and there is no requirement for authentication. So it's much, much less compared to FTP and it would also um, impose some security risk. So in the next question, it asks you to go through the ports and we can start with question 6a. Transferring files between two computers on the network in a non-encrypted session, that will be file transfer protocol and that is a TCP port 20 and 21. For email delivery from the server in a network, that will be your SMTP and SMTP uh, is using port 25 for TCP. So as you go down further in the notes, you will see simple mail transfer protocol. And this is a way that we can utilize the service for mail delivery. It's able to spool, queue, and deliver mail using SMTP. So when you implement mail server like a mail exchange server, um, you would see that SMTP would be used. So the mail is stored in the server or on the disk and the software from the server is going to be able to queue messages for the appropriate inbox, outbox, and draft. It also detects and delivers mm -hmm. mail to the appropriate destination. So when you're accessing your user account, the mail can then be associated with that user account using Active Directory and also your simple mail transfer protocol. Another protocol that relates to mail is going to be your post office protocol and currently we're using version 3 or POP3. And POP3 is associated with TCP port 110 
This gives storage to facilitate the incoming mail um, on webmail. So you often see POP3 being used for webmail purposes along with IMAP. And IMAP is the Internet Message Access Protocol. And currently we're at version 4. It uses port 143 TCP. So Internet Message Access Protocol make, allows you to download your mail and um, be able to access the mail and preview the mail. So whenever you get the mail header notifying you certain mail has been delivered, that is because of IMAP. The next protocol is going to be Remote Desktop Protocol. This uses port TCP 3389. And Remote Desktop Protocol RDP is known in Windows system or Microsoft systems. It allows you to connect to another computer that runs the program. And um, so you can remote into that desktop and be able to access the resources and the file that you need. Unlike Telnet, um, Telnet is in the encrypted text, RDP would require the both system to agree on the communication. You would use a graphical user interface or an application to be able to access it. And so RDP, it was called the terminal services. And later on, they changed the name to be RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol. It is a good tool to remote into the client system, especially when the client systems are Microsoft Windows. Um, so you would use RDP in Microsoft Windows environment to connect to another system. Transport Layer Security, which is your TLS, and Secure Socket Layer, your SSL, are commonly found in the web. They are encrypted protocols that is used for a lot of the websites. So normally you would see the these protocol being implemented with HTTPS. It's used for web browsing, instant messaging, internet faxing, and many other things. They both use X509 certificate and asymmetric encryption to authenticate. So when you're logging in to pay your bill on an HTTPS website or when you're using um, HTTPS website, likely that you are using TLS or the older technology would be Secure Socket Layer. Secure Socket Layer is vulnerable. so. Most of the website will be implemented in TLS instead. Um, Secure Socket Layer has the Heartbleed issue a while back, and they have updated the, the technology, but the documentation also suggests that there is existing vulnerability. So therefore, you would see most website that is HTTPS supported would be using TLS. SIP is used for voice or calls over the network and SIP stands for Session Initiation Protocol. It is popular in the construct and deconstruct of multimedia communication session. So when you're making a video call like using Zoom or when you're calling using Google Voice, video conferencing or when you're streaming multimedia uh, distribution, instant messages, uh, chatting, things like that, you are actually using SIP. And um, so SIP is often found in a lot of video conferencing like Teams or even um, for your Zoom um, and other technology like Skype and so on. So going back to the assignment, we can continue answering some of the questions related to our protocol for number six. For C, client system that connects to the webmail servers to access mail, that will be your post office protocol version three. It is using TCP port 10, 110. 
For question D, client system downloading and searching email using headers, that will be IMAP, Internet Message Access Protocol, which is port 143 under TCP. Question E, Windows system connecting to another computer to run programs. That will be Remote Desktop Protocol, RDP, port 3389, then that's under TCP. Question 6F, Secure Online Data Transfer on the Web. That will be Transport Layer Security, TLS, and Secure Socket Layer. That will be port 995 and 465 under TCP. Question G, construct and deconstruct multimedia communication sessions such as voice, video calls, video conferencing, streaming multimedia distribution, instant message, and online game over the internet. That will be SIP, Session Initiation Protocol, TCP or UDP port number 5060 and TCP port number 5061. So it uses two types of port, 5060 50, or 5061. Another protocol that we're going to go over is the simple network management protocol, which pull devices to gather network information for reporting. SNMP is using port UDP 161. So let's switch back to our notes. In the note, it also included RTP, also uses for VoIP, real-time transport protocol, in which the packets are formatted with the standard to deliver audio and video over the internet. And this is another protocol that you would find in video conferencing like Zoom. MGCP, multimedia, uses port TCP 2427 or 2727. This is known as the Media Gateway Control Protocol. This is the protocol that handles signal and session management for multimedia conferences. Protocol defines the mean to communicate between the media gateway and convert the data formatted for the circuit switch in the network. <coughs> so when you're dealing with media servers, media streaming or multimedia or like uh, call centers, things like that, you would often see this type of protocol and the prior protocols. <coughs> Simple network management protocol is found on page five. This allows the system to collect and manipulate mm -hmm. network information. It's so in order to gather which system is connected to the network, we would use SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol, mm -hmm. which uses UDP port 161. And so in, in order to really manage which system and how the systems are connected, basically we would use SNMP. So when you're polling how many networks network systems are communicating, that is the use of SNMP. Secure Shell SSH is using port TCP as we mentioned that the SFTP uses Secure Shell earlier. Secure Shell protocol is used for um, setting up remote connection and it is highly secure compared to Telnet so you can think about the next generation of protocols such as um, that would be replacing Secure Shell in that we would now require more remote connection from one system to another. Hypertext Transfer Protocol, your HTTP uses port 80 for TCP and this allows mm -hmm. your browser to translate the content of a web page. It's used to manage communication between the web browser and the web server so that way we can open the right resources 
and be able to display the right information on our system when we we're typing in the URL. HTTPS uses port TCP443, which is known as Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. And this is the secure version of HTTP. It allows you to process transaction when you access a certain website via your browser. And it uses encryption which I previously mentioned that it would use services from TLS or SSL. So you can um, make purchases online or visit secure website and so on. Network time protocol uses UDP 123 and this was created by Professor David Mills from University of Delaware. Network time protocol works in con conjunction with other synchronization utility so the computer can sync with the network and it's so as computers might have different time this particular protocol is needed for synchronization purposes so your NTP is used for synchronization lightweight ac directory access control protocol TCP port 389 this is used to um, support Active Directory in Windows environment. Administrator can manage objects, user accounts, and system um, as a directory. So when the user or the system is accessing certain resources, they are required to authenticate with username, password, biometrics, etc. This particular protocol is in charge of um, that aspect of accessing the directory on the network for, for the server. Internet Group Management Protocol Internet Group man uh, Management Protocol is uh, IGMP and it uses uh, it's used to manage multicast IP meaning that the IPs that's being sent to multiple system and it would be unique because the host machine in an IP network uses IGMP to become a member of the group so when a system is joining a domain or a system is joining a certain part of the network IGMP is used to track the membership of that group and it would be able to activate the multicast of the IP addresses on that network. IGMP works in the network layer and you often see IGMP being incorporated in routing or the router. Server message block, your SMB, is using port TCP 445. This is used to share access with files and printers so if you have a printer on the network and it is being shared across um, multiple systems or in a segment you are using SMB and so SMB runs on can also run on port UDP 137, 138 and 139 for TCP using NetBIOS so you often also see SMB in Windows operating system or network Windows operating systems. Um, this is used to allow us to share mm -hmm. files and printers. Domain name service DNS is using port TCP or and UDP 53. It's used to resolve host names, internet names such as the fully qualified domain name like your URL to the corresponding IP address. So all the website out there like Microsoft.com, Google.com, the URL is tied to the public IP and so the domain name is being managed by IANA along with the public IP addresses. So this particular protocol is used to correlate the domain name to the IP address. 
You can also have domain that exists inside the network and all the system that is part of the client server says environment usually would then need to join the domain and you can also have subdomain or child domain under that to in order to support the hierarchy of domains we would then use DNS and DNS is a role of a server that provides the service um, in that particular type of network so the fully qualified domain name is what you would refer to as URL www.google.com etc so then for the fully qualified domain name it would then need to be registered as far as web based and internally you would then establish that through the DNS server dynamic host configuration protocol um, that will be an bootstrap protocol your DHCP this is used to assign IP addresses to the network and we often use this internally so your wireless router at home its job also is to assign IP addresses and it would um, ha take a role of the DHCP along with routing and other things inside your small network the HCP differs from bootstrap protocol or boot P in that boot P also assign IP address to the host but the host hardware address must be entered manually using boot P whereas the HCP um, is more automated so the dynamic address the private address inside your network we would use the HCP to distribute the address to the systems and the system can have a certain uh, lease to the address where there will be a number of days that it can obtain the IP address and if a certain IP address is not in use it would then give it back to the network and it can be reused for other systems so to finish the questions that we started which is six we were at six each we talked about how SNMP would be used to pull devices and gather network information, uh, the, the device information on the network, and that's SNMP, UDP, port number 61, 161. And to synchronize time across the network, we would use NTP, or Network Time Protocol, that uses UDP port 123. To assign IP addresses to computer system inside a network for J, we would use DHCP and that uses port 67 mm -hmm. or 68 under UDP. And here concludes mm -hmm. my video for um, Unit 2 Part 1 and I will include OSI layers in the next video which is going to be unit 2 lecture part 2 so please look for the video and watch the video so you can complete the assignment thank you for watching this video